Welcome to WSKG Science Hub screening and conversation of the age of nature. Please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. Welcome to OV, a virtual theater that allows you to watch together and chat live with friends, fans, and experts. Grab your favorite sip of something, maybe a snack, and let's start the show. I am Nancy Coddington, Director of Science Content at WSKG Public Media. And tonight, we're watching The Age of Nature, a three-part series that will air on WSKG TV starting tomorrow evening, October 14th at 10 p.m. This event is presented by WSKG Public Media, Science Pub Bing, Tanglewood Nature Center and Museum, and Waterman Conservation Education Center. I would like to introduce one of the co-founders of Science Pub Bing, Julie Weisberg. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you all of you for joining us tonight. We are pleased to introduce our panelists that will join us after the screening to answer your questions. Joining us is the Executive Director of Tanglewood Nature Center and Museum in Elmira, New York, Elaine Spaker, PhD student in Anthropology at Ohio State University, Ben Murtis, Executive Director of the Waterman Conservation Education Center, Chris Audet, and Jeff Smith, a board member and naturalist at Waterman Conservation Education Center. Our panelists are here to answer your questions after the screening. Thank you, Julie. We have a great evening planned for you tonight. And we ask that you please type your questions and comments into the chat box during the screening. And we'll do our best to get them all answered uh, after the screening with our experts. You can also use the emoticons under the video player to express yourself if you find something really that you like or um, maybe not like during, during the screening. If you, don't, if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. There will also be poll questions popping up during the screening. You can participate by clicking on the questions to answer them. We're going to begin tonight's screening with a WSKG produced video on the critical zone. This is the zone that supports life on Earth. This short video shares how scientists are working together across disciplines, connecting life sciences with Earth science and weaving the threads of science together. Following the critical zone, the age of nature screening will begin. There may be a little lag before the video starts. Please just stay with us. The screening will begin momentarily. Earth is in a constant state of transformation. From large scale disasters, both natural and man-made, to the microscopic chemical processes that control decay and decomposition. It is becoming ever more evident that our ecosystem is under increasing pressure from global change, leaving many people wondering, how will our landscapes respond? Across the country, scientists believe that we can better understand how our Earth will respond to this global pressure by studying what they call the critical zone. The critical zone is the part of the Earth's environment in which we as humans interact. It's where rock meets life. It's the veneer of the continental land surface that extends from the top of vegetation and the canopy down through soil and bedrock to whatever depth fresh groundwater is circulating. We call it the zone of transformation because that's where things happen. That's where atmospheric CO2 is turned into plant material. That's where plant material is turned back into atmospheric CO2. That's where water is transformed from rainwater into groundwater and stream water. All those processes take place in the critical zone. It's a very active and dynamic zone. It's the zone where really important things happen at the Earth's surface. It provides the food that we eat. It filters and cleans the water that we drink and provides us the oxygen that we breathe. So it's imperative to understand the critical zone. But I think even beyond that, it's critical also to, to all types of life. Uh, this is where most ecosystems live that are terrestrial, you know, life on this planet. Here in the U.S., a network of nine critical zone observatories, or CZOs, provide scientists with an important window through which to make key observations about the structure and function of critical zone processes. Each observatory is located on a unique landscape, from the wooded hills of the northeast to the deserts of the southwest and the snow-covered Rocky Mountains. Each provides scientists with another piece of the puzzle to understanding the critical zone. The advantage of having many different critical zone observatories gives us the opportunity to look at similar processes, um, be they physical or chemical or biological, in different systems. So um, ones that are sitting on different geologies that have 
different tree species associated with them um, have different ecosystems as a function of that, different climates. The observatories represent really very small portions of the landscape. And so if we want the science that we're accomplishing here to be meaningful, we have to bring that science to be uh, applicable to larger pieces of the landscape. Well, what we're trying to do is really understand the critical zone as a thing, and we're trying to really look at it as if it's all one entity and understand all the different processes that are going on, whether it's biological, physical, geological, hydrological, and we get all sorts of people with all sorts of expertise that, that study different pieces of it. Scientists at the various CZOs each bring their own unique backgrounds and skill sets to bear on common problems, working together to reach new solutions. It is work that by its very nature is interdisciplinary. The beauty of critical zone science lies within its interdisciplinary nature. And so part of the motivation for critical zone science is in getting different disciplines talking and communicating with, with each other. We often think of those sciences as being um, separate disciplines, and one of the things that's really nice about the Critical Zone Observatories is it gives people that study those varying disciplines um, a seat at the same table so we can talk about um, processes that interrelate that maybe we wouldn't have known about otherwise. We need to bring a lot of different tools to bear to understand this Critical Zone because it's quite a complicated system. It's not one person doing one kind of thing. It's a group of people with different tools, different sets of knowledge, working on the same system that has a lot of different facets. You know, sometimes I think about it like the fabrics in weaving. You know, if we can, you know, what we used to do is look at the threads separately, each of us. And, and then we try to weave it together, but we didn't know where it went at all. Well, now we've got the threads that we're looking at separately, but it's all in the same location. We can see how they all go back together. And so now we're starting to put it back together and come up with real deep understanding that we didn't have before. Scientists who study the critical zone are trying to better understand this system with and without the pressures of human impact. The biggest impact I think humans have on the critical zone is the fact that we are changing our climate so significantly. By introducing carbon into the atmosphere, which is increasing temperatures, we are changing the hydrologic cycle. Um, and in that process, we're changing all of the other cycles that, that hinge on water as, as a piece of it. Well, it turns out that more and more humans are playing a huge part. Uh, you know, obviously we're changing things globally. We're changing the climate globally, which impacts the critical zone. But we are considered the biggest geologic force on the planet now. So erosion is faster today than it, than it has been in the geologic past. And it's really because of, of humans. We as humans can only understand how we negatively impact the critical zone and the way the various linked processes of chemistry, biology, geology, and the atmosphere interact with each other if we understand how they operate without us in nature. But we need to understand how we're changing the critical zone and what that means in terms of how it changes into the future. Because, you know, we're messing it up. You know, we're pulling the threads out and changing things. And, you know, we need to understand, you know, what's important about the changes that we're making. Increasingly, uh, our planet is being adversely affected by humanity. And so if we're going to be able to sustain our presence on the planet, we need to reduce our impacts on these natural processes that are here and allow us to, to thrive. I'm Nancy Coddington, Director of Science Content at WSKG Public Media and one of the co-founders of Science Pub. It is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's dynamic panel. Elaine Spaker has a bachelor's degree in biology from SUNY Brockport and a master's degree in biology from the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Elaine studies in college focused on ecology, animal behavior, and ornithology, and more specifically, cavity and colonial nesting bird species. Elaine has been interested in environmental issues for over three decades. She's worked at several nature centers and museums, including Genesee County Museum's Nature Center in Mumford and Virginia Living Museum in Newport News, Virginia. Elaine has been on the board at Spencer Crest Nature Center in Corning, New York, and is currently a board member of the Shimung County Chamber of Commerce. 
Elaine has been the Executive Director at Tanglewood Nature Center and Museum in Elmira for the past 17 years. Welcome, Elaine. Hi, thanks for having me. Jeff Smith from Vestal, New York has had a lifelong interest in nature and ecology, which he's been able to focus on more intently since retiring from IBM. Recently, that has involved serving as a naturalist and a board member for the Waterman Center, working on cataloging and mapping plants and various invasive species on Waterman properties. He's interested in promoting public awareness of nature through photography and the exploration of the Southern Tier's unique local parks and preserves. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks, glad to be here. Ben Murtis is a PhD student in anthropology department at the Ohio State University. His research seeks to understand pathways of responsible human coexistence with non-human beings in this new epic that many are calling the Anthrosopene. He's particular, particularly interested in ecotourism as a driver of environmental sustainability and culture, cultural continuation in post-colonial First Nations communities in Canada. Welcome, Ben. Thanks for having me, Nancy. Chris Audat is Waterman Center's Executive Director and is from Endicott, New York. Chris grew up in Vermont, where he was seldom not waist deep in muck, lake, or stream. He studied aquatic ecology at Paul Smith College, served in southeastern Africa with the US Peace Corps, and loves sharing his knowledge and experience with the Waterman community. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Nancy. Thrilled to be here. So, Chris, we're actually going to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role at the Waterman Conservation Education Center? Uh, Sure, I'm the executive director. That means I um, manage um, upkeep and, and maintenance at all of the parks um, at the Interpretive Center. I manage our staff and all of our outreach uh, and, um, you know, all the way down to uh, mopping the floors and, and cleaning the toilets. Uh, you know, we do everything. You meant wear many hats, as many people that work in not-for-profits are well aware of, right? Absolutely. Jeff, can you tell me more about your role as a board member and naturalist at Waterman Conservation Education Center? Sure. Well, I became uh, more associated with Waterman as I started to work on problems after I retired. And the first problem I worked on was the, uh, the trouble with hemlocks, the hemlock woolly adelgids. And then I sort of switched over to some invasive plants because I saw diversity was different at the different sites, even though it didn't seem like it should be. So I've been working with invasive plants most lately, um, and it's been an interesting time. We're going to try to address them uh, on a site-wide basis at the different waterman sites. So that's currently what I'm up to. Great, thank you. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, Elaine, can you tell me more about what you do at Tanglewood Nature Center and, you know, how, how can people be engaged with Tanglewood? Sure. Um, I'm also the executive director, like Chris is, uh, so I do all the things that he said, including the toilets, but um, my main job with the rest of the staff is to educate. So at Tanglewood, um, we are are responsible, we feel responsible for preservation of our natural world and teaching people to care about the natural world and teach, teaching them just to be aware of what's around them. Um, so we do that through having, we have 300 acres of land that have over nine miles of hiking trails that are open dawn to dusk 365 days a year. And we have over 40 species of live animal ambassadors that we use for our programming and some of them are on display and they're all injured non-releasables. So that's how they um, are able to be with us and help us get closer to people. Um, we have a hands-on museum and we educate over 30,000 people every year. Um, but we also are a place where you, you the colleges have been able to do research. Um, we've done some of our own grassland rehabilitation, and um, we are a site for actually for the Cornell's Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Initiative. We were one of the places in New York State where they were released the silverfly. So, um, and like most nonprofits, and we're a small nonprofit, but the ways to get involved in, in, in either of our nonprofits is you know. 
time and talent. Uh, we'll take volunteers and, and you know that want to do anything to help us. Obviously, you know from fundraising to animal care to being, you know, a, a teacher, a docent, um, and you know we love people who want to help us fundraise. That's the bigger thing, a big thing. Um, but we love people who want to help us with anything. So there's always ways to get involved. You can be on the board. You can be a volunteer. Um, you know, you can give a donation. <laughs> Lots of different ways. But we both have websites. So go visit them and find out how you, how you can help more. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, ben, you're studying anthropology at Ohio State University. Uh, can you tell us more about that and what attracted you to anthropology? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for those who don't know, anthropology is basically just the study of humans just writ large. Um, and I'm a cultural anthropologist, uh, also an environmental anthropologist. So I got into the field because I'm interested in the environment just as much as anyone else on this panel. And I'm interested in sustainability. And as far as, you know, as far as science is concerned <laughs> at this point, uh, climate change is anthropogenic. And the climate crisis that we're facing right now is caused by humans. So I wanted to go into anthropology to understand ways to live more sustainably uh, in the future. Great, thank you. Um, Elaine, what makes the Age of Nature series a compelling story? You know, why, why should we care about this topic? Um, so I really like how each segment of the Age of Nature starts out with the same quote. And you heard it twice, and I'm going to say it again because I think it's really good. Um, we are at a turning point in history and are moving in a new direction. How we live with nature now will determine our future. Um, I think that's a really good way to start this all out, but also just to remind us that we are part of, you know, everything that happens on Earth, and this series is timely because of everything that's happening right now in our world, from climate change to natural resource decline to vanishing species to people spending less time outdoors um, and suffering because of it. And even COVID, all of those are related to, you know, how we navigate our every day to day and how we interact with nature and our signs that we need to take action. So I think it's a really great time for the series to come out. Yeah, I, I think. Um, you know, I think the way the series opened by talking about, or I'm sorry, the way the uh, WSKG produced segment opened, talking about studying the critical zone um, is so poignant because we truly are where the rubber meets the road in terms of where we've gone the wrong direction and, and where we're going to go the right direction as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we've been, there's just room for improvement all over the place. <laughs> Um, Chris, can you actually talk a little bit about some of the unique habitats and locations that are part of the Waterman Conservation Collection? Because you have a lot of facilities that I don't think people are aware of. We, we have facilities that I think people visit almost every day and they don't realize that Waterman uh, is the organization that makes it possible. Um, first and foremost would, uh, in this category would be the IBM Glen. Um, since the early 2000s, we've been managing that property. Um, but including the IBM Glen, um, we uh, own and manage six different properties. Um, a few in Appalachian, uh, our, our um, hallmark uh, interpretive center and, and trail system on Hilton Road. Uh, the Appalachian Marsh, which is actually in between the lanes of travel on Route 17. Um, Hiawatha Island, um, but also Brick Pond in Owego and the Pettis Hill Preserve in Windsor. Now the age of nature kept on cycling back to the importance of forests, whether it be um, you know, helping to safeguard uh, water supplies like in Panama um, or you know, capturing carbon uh, and, and contributing to carbon negativity. Uh, such as in Bhutan, um, you know, we have a lot of forests with a waterman. 
Uh, we also have wetlands. Um, you know, we have different slopes and a whole bunch of different um, tree species. We have an island. Uh, there are so many different types of ecosystems you can visit when you come to a waterman preserve. That's great. And then where can people find out more information about that? Um, watermancenter.org is our website. And if you go to the visit section, um, you can get directions and, and, and short descriptions of all of our preserves. Um, we also um, put a lot of information on our Facebook page. That's great, thank you. Um, Jeff, so you had already touched on this a little bit already, but you're working on cataloging invasive species on the Waterman properties. Um, what does that mean and what kind of species are you finding? Well, it's an offshoot of just cataloging diversity in general for plants. And uh, in looking at the different areas, there's different diversities in places that seems like it should be the same. So that sort of got me looking a little bit further and it ended up uh, trying to understand the extent of invasive plants on those on the different sites. So we mapped them and we listed some priority plants that are problematic at those areas. And we're going to try to address them through uh, uh, getting rid of some of them and controlling others and probably moving in some native plants uh, to fill the vacuum. There's a lot of plants, there's a lot of different plants involved. There's things like Japanese knotweed, which is a problem all over. Um, there's, there's a lot of other invasive plants that, that come into play, garlic mustard. Different plants have different fixes and we're gonna try to be methodical about it. And that's one of the reasons that there's a, there's a list and, a, and an inventory of plants so that we can check back to see if we're doing a good job. Also as climate changes, uh, we'll be able to monitor what changes might occur against a base level. Great, thank you. Thank you. Is there a way that the public can get involved with the work that you're doing on, on those invasive species removal? Sure, the, the public can be made aware of it clearly. The public can visit the sites. We're, they're gonna be able to see some of the work we're doing. We'd like people to get involved with it in different ways. We haven't quite settled how that's gonna work out, but uh, clearly there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for education. So we're still trying to figure out how things are gonna to fit together and it's gonna be a bit of an effort and a lot of learning on our part too. Yeah, exactly, Jeff. Um, we're gonna need a lot of help, <laughs> especially as we uh, kind of plan the way forward. Um, like Elaine said, we always need volunteers um, on our website. There's a, a volunteer section where you can learn more um, or reach out at info at watermancenter.org if you're interested in uh, filling out a volunteer application. It's funny, uh, the Waterman Center's history is really rooted in uh, trying to raise awareness about environmental issues and what we're seeing going forward is uh, you know, in the face of especially invasive species, we're taking a more active role in forest management. And uh, I think teaching people how they can contribute to that uh, is, is going to be part of the way forward. Yeah, absolutely. Elaine, I want to jump to something that you were talking about with um, the invasive woolly adelgid. Uh, you said you were working with Cornell University and the release of the silver fly. Can you talk a little bit more about that work? Sure. Um... Cornell had knew that we had um, hemlocks, uh, a nice hemlock stand. And so they reached out to us and asked um, if they could come and, and do some release of a biocontrol um, organism that they had been growing in their lab. Um, and because they had been tangle, to Tanglewood before, they held a workshop about identifying that woolly adelgid and trying to see if you had any um, if your trees at home or in, on your forest land had adelgid, um, and they had done a previous one on the um, emerald ash borer, we had a good relationship with them and we sort we trusted them and, and their science. So they asked if they could release the silver fly at Tanglewood and we said sure. And so they did that, I think three years ago and they come out every year and, and see if this silver fly will eat the adelgid and um, so that we don't lose all our hemlocks. And I haven't heard exactly how it's going yet. It's still kind of early, early days um, as far as scientific research goes, but we're hopeful. Great, thank you. I, mean, I, I see a, a future 
collaboration <laughs> between Waterman and Tanglewood in terms of uh, teaching about the, the hemlock woolly of Elgid, which is an invasive insect that uh, essentially drains the life out of ancient hemlock trees. At the IBM Glen, we have hemlocks that are 400 years old. Um, we're also partnering with Cornell. Um, so I think that's a, a great way forward is to um, you know, maybe have some, some trainings and events such as this one, a webinar on uh, identifying if the trees in your yard or in your woodlot are impacted by these uh, invasives and, and what you might be able to do about it. And, uh, you know, options are currently slim, but I feel like they're increasing. Um, and, and hopefully this will, supply will pan out. There we go. There's a future science pub for us. I like that uh, to continue mm -hmm. that, that education. Um, I have a question from our audience. I'm just going to ask it and lob it out to anybody because uh, I'm not sure who might be the best one to answer this, but what other countries, um, this is referencing back to the age of nature and uh, what happened in Panama with looking at that water situation and the Panama Canal, uh, what other countries have done something similar to Panama of protecting at least 25% uh, of their land by creating these large uh, national uh, parks? I can say that a lot of countries need to. Um... And, and that's not all such an easy thing to do. Uh, firsthand in Malawi, I've seen the impacts of deforestation, um, again, due to uh, a push for, for traditional agricultural systems um, to make room for settlement, uh, and, and then a reliance on firewood and charcoal. Uh, and, and drought in that region of the world is a, a huge problem exacerbated by uh, deforestation. The question is, how do you address the, the socioeconomic um, hurdles to reforesting while, while still providing for people's needs? I think that uh, uh, Bali might be a good example as well, um, because the farmers in Bali, uh, the, the traditional farmers use uh, what's called a Balinese water temple uh, system of agriculture. And in the 60s, uh, and when we were kind of in this age of uh, like international development and containment of communism, uh, international aid went to Bali and kind of tore down the, the water temple system, which was like their traditional way of farming, um, with the idea that with the Green Re Revolution, their uh, yields would be so much higher uh, because new technology was Become, like, becoming advanced. And the problem was uh, pests just ran wild because the Balinese water temple system was meant, uh, it basically like kept all of the rats out of the rice paddies um, because of how it was set up. So uh, I'll, I'll, like in, in the early 2000s, basically it was reversed and the farmers and a lot of the farmers in Bali now use the traditional uh, agriculture systems and it just, it works a lot better. Uh, so that's like, it's a good example. That's a great example, uh, Ben. Uh, one one that I've seen both in, in Zambia and Malawi is fusion of uh, returning to traditional systems that developed over centuries to, to suit the local landscape um, with, you know, kind of um, more modern ideas like uh, composting and, and green manures and, and agroforestry and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, it's funny with the Green Revolution, we had such good intentions, um, but it ended up being a, a great example of the law of diminished returns where um, introducing all these hybrid species and um, fertilizers and, and, and different inputs um, actually had adverse effects on uh, the soils and the ecosystems. Yeah, I think oftentimes we can kill kill our planet with over over care to a certain degree. Um, like, look at what's happening in the West right now uh, with the forest fires. Um, the, the only reason that this is happening, the only reason why this blaze is big enough to uh, burn a lot of the ancient trees in the old growth forest is because we're so used to forest management that that um, sort of we don't want fires. Uh, and and previously, before we started managing these forests. 
smaller fires were able to blaze through and get rid of the uh, underbrush without burning down the bigger trees. So we never had such large <laughs> fire, forest fire problems. But now that we're managing these forests in a different way, we're facing catastrophic events like what's happening right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, we're, we're backpedaling effectively. I have another um, question from the audience um, asking, are there any uh, forest restoration programs going on in our region? Hmm. Forest restoration. Elaine, I'm, I'm trying to think of something large scale and, uh, and and I'm, I'm failing. <laughs> um, I can speak to to what Waterman is doing uh, in the sense that uh, we have an invasive species called the emerald ash borer. It's a, a insect, a beetle that uh, effectively attacks ash trees and um, totally eliminates their ability to transport water. Uh, so the trees die very quickly, they dry out very fast, and, and they become hazardous. If anybody uh, viewing this has an ash tree in their backyard, they're probably wondering what's up with it, uh, if they, they don't already know. Um, at all of our preserves, we're working towards uh, cutting down at least the, the ash trees near the trail. Um, ash trees in the, uh, the interior of our preserves where people don't often go. Um, we're, we're going to let them fall by their own accord or, or become snags, which are tremendously valuable to wildlife. Um, but what we're trying to do is as much as we can, we're going to leave those trees trail side or um, extending into the preserve so that their tops can protect uh, regeneration and the growth of uh, you know, smaller tree seedlings, um, all of those branches and the trunk and, and, and uh, the structure from the, the fallen tree can help protect seedlings from uh, browsing by, by deer and other wildlife. Yeah, and with that question, I think about I, I think about our area, like New York State. I mean, New York State is um, if you're out from outside of New York, you sort of think New York is like it's just all city, but actually, New York and State in itself is um, you know one of the top ten of the United States states um, when it comes to being forested. I mean, we we actually are, are a heavily forested state, um, and you know we have a lot of regions that are really protected, like the Adirondack park. Um, and so I think some of the management that goes on in our area, I can speak to Tanglewood, uh, we've been managing for grasslands. And so that's a time where you actually sometimes remove trees because we, um, while well, we removed trees and bushes, we had an invasive species, um, the autumn olive, or the Russian olive, it's been called. And um, so what we did is we removed autumn olive from what used to be a grassland area because we had a couple of grassland bird species that we have been excited to have, like grasshopper sparrow, which is in 98% decline um, because we've been losing our grasslands in the, in the whole of the U.S. Um, and so we got rid of some of the bushes that were invading our grassland and brought the grassland back. And we actually got bobolinks for the first time in two decades and we're still waiting for, you know, metal arcs, but they're not doing so good because um, a lot of our backyard birds are not doing so well. Um, but so there are different things that we manage, I think, in this area um, that might not be just forest, other habitats. Absolutely, including like the wetlands with our yep. amphibians. And mm -hmm. yep. there's a lot of work being done with the spotted salamanders and looking at road cells. Yep. Absolutely, and including at uh, Binghamton University and, and, and tracking their, their migrations, right? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, um, we have another audience question, um, and I'm going to see if Ben, because you did bring this up, so I'm going to toss this to you first. Uh, what is the specific link between forest management and massive uh, wildfires? What exactly are they doing to it? So as far as I understand, and Keep in mind that I'm no expert on wildfires. I'm just a humble anthropologist studying other things. But 
uh, I, I believe that the problem is that, um, so, so when fires move through a heavily forested old growth area like Oregon, which happens pretty frequently, um, without human interaction, forests like this are actually adapted to fires. Um, a lot of trees there, uh, especially the pine trees, uh, are used to having fires on a smaller scale. And they're really, they're, it's better, they more easily regenerate after small fires. Um, and I mean, if you've seen, think about like Mount St. Helens after it exploded, it was like a moonscape for a while, but then life, you know, sprouted back up uh, in, that, in that area. But the problem that we're having now is because of the forest management techniques we're using, which, which uh, makes it so that we don't have any fires at all, not even some of the smaller fires that sort of move through the heavily forested area. We're basically just setting ourselves up to have massive, massive forest fires instead of smaller fires that don't do as much damage uh, to the forest. So because of this, we're dealing with, and be, be, because of climate change as well, and because of the droughts that are happening, especially in the West, in the West uh, we're dealing with things like we're seeing right now and last year too. I mean, like we're, we're dealing with more and more forest fires every year because of, partially because of forest management and also partially because of uh, climate change on a larger scale. Yeah, it's accelerating. It's, it's, it's a cash 22 uh, in that kind of the, the more management we do or the more management we attempt, um, you know, the, the, the playing fields are evolving faster than we can adapt. A um, couple of things is, you know, when that fuel builds up, um, the fire burns hotter than, than the ecosystem can recover from. Um, whereas, you know, as, as it evolved over uh, you know, eons, um, many of the species in those forests, and even in, in forests that can be found close to here, uh, outside of Albany and, and then going towards New Jersey, uh, we have pine barrens with a species of pine called jack pine. Uh, there's a special type of cone that's coated in resin. It's called a serotonous cone. It needs fire before it can release its seeds. But if that fire is too hot, then the seeds are killed. Fortunately, you know, over years and years and years in these ecosystems, and, and the example of Mount St. Helens is, is excellent, um, you know, seeds that had been released and never germinated are there in the soil. They're part of the, what we call a seed bank. Um, and when you think back to the, the coral reefs uh, from Bikini Atoll is, you know, nature always has an insurance policy. Um, so if we can, can curb our behavior, um, nature oftentimes will take care of itself. Yeah, and I think to bounce off of that, just in a probably not extremely um, maybe popular opinion, but um, I think that we, like Ben said, we're not allowing forest fire, small forest fires to happen. We're putting things out because human habitation is close to places, you know, where fires start and we don't want to burn anybody's houses down. Obviously, that makes sense. Um, but I think because of the way we live, as far as, you know, we're living in coastal areas on the beaches where hurricanes are happening and we're living in, you know, heavily forested, really drought ridden areas. And, you know, we're trying to save these human habitations in all of those places. Um, and on top of it, we're increasing climate change, um, which is increasing the, you know, veracity of our, our hurricanes and increasing our forest fires. The winds are higher, the temperature, outdoor temperature is hotter, it's drier, so the fires are burning hotter, faster, longer, um, you know. So I, I think that we people have not always, we've made decisions based on, you know, what makes us happy instead of how we can better live with, uh, you know, the earth that we were given. Yeah, this, um, our <laughs> Western civilization's development and proliferation was based on the idea of we will bend nature to our will and modify the environment as we see fit and live in all those places you described. Um, and, and I agree. 
that uh, we need to like, seek harmony. So we're gonna stay on this topic with uh, the forest fires. There was actually a couple questions with people referencing President Donald Trump who made a comment uh, to the California governor, Jerry Brown, talking about forest raking. Um, so we've been asked, you know, is there any truth to forest raking? And could you actually um, explain what that is, forest raking? I'm gonna look, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I, I, my, my research is not in forest management, um, so I might not be the best person to answer this. But as far as I understand, uh, forest raking is this practice where uh, you, you get rid of the fuel for the fire, right, um, in, the, in the underbrush, basically, so that it can't burn to the same degree. Um, I will say that I don't think our president is the person to be uh, asking about scientific questions. I don't really think he knows what he's talking about. Uh, but as far as that goes, we've actually, <laughs> we've tried similar things before in the past. Um, I think of actually German forest management in the late 1800s, they tried something similar uh, because, you know, Germans are stereoty stereotypically really uh, orderly. Um, so there was a huge amount of lumber in this time, time period that was uh, that had potentially exported. And they had this forest management system where they had rows and rows of trees and they got rid of all of the, uh, all of the underbrush. It was like a really clean system. But the problem was that they didn't have uh, any, any nutrient cycling. There was no decomposition of the underbrush for the trees uh, so the trees couldn't proliferate and they basically died and it was a huge economic um, disaster for, <laughs> for Germany in the late 1800s um, and I would imagine that if you know we did something similar in the west uh, something similar might happen uh, I don't really think that's the way forward that's my opinion yeah I, I, I have doubts about the logistics of it um, you know, again, to be clear, I'm, I'm an aquatic ecologist. Um, yes, I study forest ecology. Um, and of course, you know, you have to recognize the value of, a, of an organic layer to the forest floor. Um, but I would, I would put my faith in the, the U.S. Forest Service um, and, and, and consult uh, you know, more specific effort, uh, experts on, on this subject. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I agree with you. You're removing that layer of that organic matter and you're going to definitely have some, some issues that are going to ripple across the, the, the web. Um, we have another audience question here. Um, so are we seeing any shifts in having companies produce less packaging waste uh, on their own versus leaving it up to the responsibility of the consumer and the end user. So are, are you, are, have you seen anything um, as far as companies kind of taking the, the lead on that and shifting to having less packaging and being more responsible stewards? Absolutely. Um, I've seen a lot of this. And I think the problem, though, is that the, the companies that are doing this uh, tend to be the companies that are producing, you know, organic, you know, like non-GMO greenwash type products, um, things that you might find it, you know, like Whole Foods, and there's nothing wrong with any of these things. But the problem is that they're more expensive than the other things that people, you know, usually would buy at Wegmans or, or Walmart or wherever you go to get your groceries. Um, so they're not really as easily accessible uh, to everybody. So there are definitely examples out there. Um, but being green tends to come at a price. Um, we have a really a system that that uh, that privileges cheap food, and it's sometimes cheaper and more convenient to wrap it in plastic. So we definitely are not seeing enough, especially on the lower end of the the price spectrum. Thank you, Ben. That that was the perfect answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, so actually, Ben, I want to stick with you for a moment. Um, because I want to ask you a little bit more about your research around responsible human coexistence with non-human beings, so uh, our animals, in this new epic that many are calling the Anthropocene. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Like, what does that mean? So the Anthropocene uh, is 
it's not actually an official term, but it's kind of a term that's becoming used more and more in uh, academic circles. And it was coined originally in like the early 2000s by the guy basically who fixed the ozone layer. Um, his name is Paul Crutzen. He's an atmospheric chemist. Um, and his idea basically is that we have caused so much damage to the earth that we're no longer in the Holocene, which is the epoch that we've been in for the past 10,000 years since the end of the last glacial maximum. Uh, we're now in the Anthropocene. And anthro, anthropos, anthropo, uh, that, that's, that term means man. So we're in the age of man, <laughs> which I think is really important to, especially this documentary that, we're, that we just watched. Um, and we're, I mean, it could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing, uh, obviously. Be right now it's a bad thing, depend like, like because we're facing ecological disaster that's self-induced. But I think that it's also a term that uh, inspires hope too, because you know, as, as the people who caused this problem, I think that we also have the agency uh, to fix it. So possibly maybe the Anthropocene could be actually a good thing rather than uh, a negative thing. But I study ecotourism. Uh, so what I do basically, I, what I did for my master's, and I, I'm interested in um, studying ecotourism to understand uh, if it's a good catalyst for cultural continuation as well as environmental sustainability. So I went to a First Nations Reserve in Quebec for my uh, master's thesis called Manawan, and I worked with an organization there called Turismo Manawan, and the people there are, are, are part of the Atikamek people of, or of First Nations people. And they take largely uh, French and Quebecois tourists on uh, really kind of a, a, a spectacular adventure. <laughs> they, they take them from their, their town of Manawan and they go to an island basically. Um, and we catch fish that we clean and eat ourselves. Uh, we ate moose several times. Um, <laughs> we listened to elders tell stories around fires. We, we had like a medicinal plant workshop that we did. And the idea behind uh, uh, things like this is that it gives the people who are, are, are doing this not only like a monetary income, but also it gives them uh, um, a reason to, to not have to clear cut their land, basically. Um, with ecotourism, you basically like you need uh, forested natural areas to do the, like ecotourism, right? Because it's, it's environmentally centered. So I, I see it as a way uh, to preserve tracts of land uh, while fostering economic prosperity among a lot of the people who need it most. So that's what I study. Thank you. And Chris, um, you've done a little bit with ecotourism when you were in Southeastern Africa. Um, can you share how ecotourism can turn into cultural exploitation? Well, I mean, that's, everything's an equation, right? And we have to make sure that we approach these issues in a balanced way uh, and, and in a respectful way. And, and I don't want, I don't want my, my response to cast cultural tourism and ecotourism in any kind of a negative light because it is an essential piece of the puzzle. Um, and um, examples like, like, like Ben with the, the Manawan um, are, are shining examples of it done in a correct way, in a respectful way that's engaging and um, creates an economy um, with uh, both the, the um, cultural group and the uh, ecosystem that's intended to be served. Um, the, the issue comes from um, less thought out approaches where um, people are coming to maybe volunteer um, during their, their gap year. And while service is a good thing, um, using uh, an experience with a, a critically underserved population in some cases um, to, to further uh, a resume uh, isn't such a good thing. Um, so we just, we need to be very careful with the way that we approach these things. I mean, think about if 
somebody from a small village in, in Zambia was wandering around your backyard, um, you know, taking pictures of your tomato plants and uh, poking fun at your roof, how would you feel? Um, that being said, if it's approached correctly, I knew a lot of my neighbors um, that would be thrilled to uh, talk about what their lives are like and uh, try to find that happy medium uh, with anybody from the uh, United States. You know, we are, our world is so small, um, but in some cases for, for, for some cultural groups, seeing an American is like meeting an alien. Um, and uh, it, that cultural exchange, I think, is really important to the future of humanity. I think that was really well put, Chris. Um, I think that, I'd like, just to add to that, I, I don't want to paint ecotourism as a silver bullet or a universal good because it's not uh, a huge problem with ecotourism is exoticism, especially by the people who come in as tourists. Because basically the people who are, you know, undergoing these, or the people who are putting, like, hosts of, of ecotourism enterprises are basically putting their culture on display for people who are coming in. And when you have interactions like that, there's definitely a power dynamic there, especially when the people who, coming, who are coming in are from a culture that colonized the culture they're coming into. So we need to be aware of, of these situations. And I think that one of the most important things in these sort of ecotourism programs is that the people who are putting them on have self-determination um, and that it's empowering for them instead of entrapping them in sort of this cultural role play that they just don't want to be in. So I think that's important. Yes, absolutely. Something that I rack my brain about is how can we make this kind of exchange, especially in developing nations and, and with economically disadvantaged groups, how can we make this exchange more equitable? You know, how can we create a flip side where, um, you know, a, a, a Malawian uh, rice farmer can, can come and, and learn what, um, you know, how farming systems in the United States are changing. Um, you know, and, and it's really difficult for us to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, in terms of, of creating that more equitable exchange. Thank you. I think that gives us a, a lot to think about with that uh, topic. That's really well said. Um, I have a question for the audience, not from the audience. Um, how many of you watching tonight have been to a local nature area to hike or picnic or just to escape what's happening over the past six months? And, and where have you gone? So please uh, type that into the chat. And also, if you haven't entered for the Age of Nature tote bag, please go ahead and get entered because we are going to be drawing those winners here shortly. And uh, we'll be wrapping up with our questions here in just a moment. Um, Jeff, nature helps us to escape from the digital world. You know, this is great that we're able to hold events like this uh, it, in, through Zoom and through the OB platforms to be able to connect uh, because this is the reality of the current moment that we're in. But with the information that's been shared tonight about our local natural areas, what do you hope our viewers leave with? Well, I, to me, the important thing is that people become aware of, of, of some of the issues like we've talked about tonight, and also get a little bit in touch with nature so that they have an awareness and uh, familiarity. A lot of the problems that are coming up in the, in the, in the future are going to be problems about mediating between man and nature, not maybe on the surface, but a layer down or two. So if you have people that aren't familiar or aren't aware, they're not gonna consider nature when they make their, their balances and they're gonna trade cheap, basically. So I think it's in our best interest to have people, the public aware and familiar with, with nature and the problems we're facing locally, globally. I, I agree, I think, you know, knowing is the first part, and I think, um, you know, the charge is really on on, on us as nature providers and, and as educators to um, really engage 
uh, with with the public and, and and with populations that we don't reach that often. Um, I think that's the first step, and and kind of talking about things like you know if you don't live close to water, for example, which um, for a lot of us, at least in this immediate region where I'm sitting, you, you tend to be close to water, but um, think about how much good a bird bath can do to, um, you know, the pollinators around where you live. Um, there's, there's, there are so many little things that individuals can do that build up uh, to, to great effect. Thank you so much. Um, we are getting close to wrapping up our time. Uh, any final words that you would like to leave us with tonight? Um, ben, why don't we go ahead and uh, start with you? Any last words? Yeah, um, just for everybody watching out there. Um, I mean, if you RSVP'd for this, I'm assuming you you're probably already have a vested interest in environmental preservation or, you know, at least interest in nature in general. But uh, like, like Chris, Chris and uh, Jeff are both saying, uh, a lot of what we can do as individuals uh, comes from what we understand we're able to do. Um, so, you know, especially if you enjoy things like this, if you have like a, any sort of knowledge of, you know, what you can do to be greener, uh, tell your friends <laughs> and, and try to create a cultural movement because I think that's, you know, one of the only ways that we're going to reverse a lot of the problems that we have. So spread the word, uh, tell your friends to do things to be greener. That's what I would say. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Chris. Um, well, just continuing on, 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 um, you know, what we can, can do. I think that's the, the, the most important takeaway. And, and I think what, what our, our viewers want to know most is, is, you know, what can I possibly do? And, uh, you know, I want to go back to Panama and I want to stress that um, deforestation um, and, and the impervious surfaces, uh, you know, where water can't get into the soil uh, works in the other way too. It doesn't just cause water, it causes water uh, surplus often in catastrophic ways which we've seen in our region. Um, and I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to announce um, that the Waterman Center is working with New York State to um, implement and demonstrate uh, a host of um, different technologies and strategies that businesses and, and individuals can use to uh, reduce the amount of stormwater that leaves the properties. Um, even something as simple as installing a rain barrel, you know, just a handful of gallons that don't go into the storm sewer off your property, multiply that by our entire population um, and, and think how much of an effect that could have on flooding. Um, and then add in all the other technologies and um, think of how much we can reduce. Uh, so I'm very, very proud uh, and, and look for exciting things coming to the Waterman Center in the future. Great, thank you. Uh, Elaine. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just really happy to be here with a bunch of people that are like-minded and, you know, that give me hope. I was thinking about the, that former leader of Bhutan who, you know, Bhutan, who was saying, even though they've done so much hard work there to become carbon neutral, um, that, you know, but they're still, because of climate change, because of what other people in the world are doing, they're still, you know, um, at risk for their landscape and their life. Um, he still has hope. And I think that, you know, I have hope just because we're doing this and there's people who actually are spending their Tuesday night, you know, listening to us. And um, so if you're one of those who has hope, you know, spread it. And remember when you're, when you're doing things on your day to day, you know, what you need as a human, which is an animal to survive. You need clean air and clean water and 
a place where you can have your food come from that isn't contaminated and you also need to be able to walk outside and hear the birds and you know have something to look forward to that is outside of your little you know little home sphere in your office in your that part of your life and so you know just don't give up hope and right now vote like your life depended on it because it does thank you and jeff yeah well i think my my basic message is to get out and experience nature it's it's an old adage i know but uh, the global is important the local is right here you can uh, uh, look globally but act locally now we have problems that are here now with invasive plants with emerald ash borer with a uh, spotted lanternfly there's other things going to be coming uh, so there's a lot of opportunity now to work with nature to work with nature centers and to help fix little things here now and that all adds up to making a big difference absolutely um, I want to thank you for participating in today's screening and discussion. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. A special thank you to our panelists, Executive Director of Tanglewood Nature Center and Museum in Elmira, Elaine Spaker, PhD student in anthropology at Ohio State University, Ben Murtis, Executive Director of Waterman Conservation Education Center, Chris Audette, and Jeff Smith, board member and naturalist at Waterman Conservation Education Center. We really appreciate your time and, and expertise. Uh, the winners of our tote bag were pasted into the chat. Uh, we will be emailing you probably tomorrow for uh, information on how to get that to you. You can keep in touch with us at WSKG.org. Uh, you can also keep in touch with Science Pub's uh, Facebook page to learn when the next Science Pub event will be taking place in November, which was going to be about uh, your skin. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, please take a moment to share your feedback about tonight's event with the link that is being pasted into the chat. Uh, this it has been a grant funded opportunity and it's really helpful for us to give our funders back some information. So please go ahead and um, take that survey for us. That would really be helpful for us. I want to thank our WSKG team that's behind the scenes of tonight's production. Bailey Norman, uh, Alyssa, Alyssa Micha, and Science Pub's Julie Weisberg. Thank you for keeping things running smoothly tonight. Uh, we invite you to stay connected at WSKG.org on our social accounts, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and with the Science Pub Bing Facebook page. You can watch the Age of Nature three-part series beginning tomorrow evening, October 14th at 10 p.m. on WSKG TV, or you can stream Age of Nature on the PBS app. And that's going to run for the next uh, three weeks and we hope that you enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope you have a good night.